All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar for this evening. Our topic tonight is long-term maintenance and emotional barriers of chronic kidney disease. And just before we get started, just a couple things to let you know about the program. Um, so our format includes a short presentation followed by um, an interactive discussion. So at the end, you'll have a chance to ask questions. And how you'll do this is you'll type in a question, um, use the question section from the webinar toolbar that hopefully you've seen. Um, you can just go in there and type your question and our presenter will um, will answer for you. And we really do look forward to this being an interactive webinar. And just some disclaimers, we know that the information you are about to hear may motivate you um, to make some lifestyle changes, but please consult your physician before making any changes um, to your current routine. The Cecilia Health uh, Registered Dietitian will provide strategies to help you manage your CKD, um, but the online Q&A session is intended to give general advice. Um, information is not a substitute for medical, your personal medical advice with your personal doctor and involves um, just the professional opinion of the Cecilia Health Registered Dietitian. So who is that dietitian? It is uh, Nicole Holmes. She will be presenting today. Um, she is a registered dietitian who works in, in the chronic kidney disease program at Cecilia Health. She also works for her local hospital where she works with a variety of conditions in an inpatient setting. Um, she uses her wide array of experiences and knowledge to help people find a balance between eating uh, the food they love, but doing so in a healthy way and using customized nutritional plans. Nicole's goal is to help people live longer, healthier lives. So, all right, Nicole, take it away. Awesome. So thank you, Ashley, for that wonderful introduction. So as Ashley mentioned, my name is Nicole, and I will be talking to you today about the long-term maintenance and emotional barriers that are associated with chronic kidney disease. So for the long-term maintenance of chronic kidney disease, we are going to be discussing things like controlling blood pressure and blood glucose, uh, smoking cessation, weight management, and finally preparing for dialysis and how managing all of these areas can help us to maintain our overall health and our kidney health. Then we will be discussing the emotional barriers that can come with chronic kidney disease diagnosis. So things like how to manage our mental health, how to recognize anxiety and depression, stress reduction techniques, how these things can affect our sexual function, and finally, how to find support to help us in any and all of these areas. So like I said, let's start by talking about the long-term maintenance of chronic kidney disease. So why is the long-term maintenance of chronic kidney disease important? Well, chronic kidney disease is something that requires lifelong maintenance if we are to maintain our overall health and our kidney health. So keeping blood pressure and blood sugars in range can really help to minimize the damage to our kidneys and can help to maintain their long-term function. Things like quitting smoking can really help to improve our health. Yes, it can help to improve the health of our lungs, but it also has a really big impact on our kidney health as well as things like weight management. So by maintaining a healthy weight, we can help to reduce the risk of diabetes and hypertension, which are two of the main risk factors for chronic kidney disease. But finally, sometimes dialysis will be needed when the kidneys can no longer take care of the body's needs. So we will be talking about that a little more in depth as well today. So first, let's start by talking about how to control the blood pressure and why this is so important. So blood pressure is when the force of blood against the artery walls increases enough to cause damage. This is actually the second most common cause of chronic kidney disease in America today. While there's no cure for high blood pressure, treatment like making healthy lifestyle changes and taking your medication can really help to manage our blood pressure. And the better we manage our blood pressure, the more likely we are to maintain our kidney health for the long term. 
So now let's talk about controlling our blood glucose or our blood sugar and how this is important for our kidney health. So people with diabetes and kidney disease should try to see a diabetes educator at least yearly to help with monitoring, education, and support because ongoing checkups and follow-ups are really important with kidney disease and diabetes because having good control of your blood sugars can help to maintain the long-term health of our kidneys. So whether it's through diet, lifestyle, medication, things like that, the management of those blood sugars has a really big impact on our kidney health. Okay, so now let's talk about smoking cessation. So smoking is not just bad for your lungs, it's also bad for your kidneys. And for that matter, it can cause disease in almost every organ of the body. People who smoke are more likely to have protein in their urine, and this is a sign that your kidneys are under stress. And remember, the best way to maintain our kidney health is to maintain our overall health and to keep those kidneys functioning as long as possible. That's something we really need to focus on. So a few tips if you're thinking about quitting is to start by just picking a date, right? Like penciling that in, permanent marking it in, pick a date that you wanna stop and then change your environment. So maybe you have things in your environment that trigger you to want to smoke. So you should start by trying to remove those from the environment and then replace other things that would encourage you to not pick up that cigarette and start smoking. It's also a good idea to let others know that you're quitting. This can really help to have, when we have that support of others, like they're checking in on us and they're following up with us, you know, checking to see how things are going can be really encouraging. Um, and you can also start by talking with your doctor. So your doctor can prescribe medications or even help identify some resources that can help you fight those urges that tend to pop up when we first quit smoking. Okay, so now on to weight management. So excess weight can increase our risk of diabetes and hypertension. And like I mentioned before, those are two major causes of chronic kidney disease. So when it comes to weight management, diet and lifestyle, including exercise, are two of the biggest factors that can really impact our weight. Now, before you start any diet or exercise program, though, you should always check with your health care provider. But when you're ready to get started, here are a few tips that can really help. First, log it, right? So keep a food and or exercise log. It can really help to track food that you're eating because sometimes we don't even realize how much we're eating throughout the day, right? Like oftentimes I hear people say that they're just snacking throughout the day, but when we really write those snacks down, we see that those snacks can add up to be a lot of calories and a lot of excess sugar throughout the day. Likewise, tracking exercise can be really important, especially when we have those days when we just don't feel like getting up and getting moving, to look back at a logbook and see just how far we've come and how many exercises we've done that can be really motivating and can really help us to get up and get going. So with that being said, it's also really important to create an exercise plan. So it can become really stressful if we don't have a plan and we're just trying to like squeeze in these random workouts throughout the day and, you know, just trying to make them work in the day whenever they work out. But if you pick a time that will work seamlessly into your schedule and you pick a routine so you know exactly what you're doing and what you're doing on which day, it takes the guesswork out. And this really helps to stick to the plan a little bit better. And then when it comes to healthy food choices, I love to say just start simple, right? Start with simple swaps in your diet. So for example, maybe you start by switching out potato chips for unsalted popcorn or switch your pretzels out for carrot sticks. Maybe instead of that sweet treat, you have an apple. Um, you, you switch out that soda for a sparkling water, right? Like you get the idea of just these small habits that can add up to make a really big difference overall. And then don't forget, you can always talk to a dietitian, right? Because we don't want to have to find ourselves being stressed about food or feeling hungry throughout the day. So talking with a dietitian um, can help you set up a diet plan, you know, it, it, so that we don't have to worry about what is going to be our next meal and is it going to work into our diet plan and that's where it really starts with planning your meals um, coming up with those snacks so that you know throughout the day you're making the right choices and then it also helps us to make those snacks convenient right because if we know we're going to have it later in the day we can prep it get it ready in the morning we know exactly what we're going to reach for in the afternoon and then 
honestly, this is a really big one to really just slow down while you're eating. So it actually takes our stomach about 15 minutes to tell our brain that we're starting to feel full. And I don't know about you, but I can put away a lot of food in 15 minutes. So it's just a good idea to try to slow down while we're eating, whether it's, you know, trying to carry on a conversation with someone, maybe you take sips of water in between bites, maybe you set down your fork in between your bites. Um, and what I always tell people is if you're feeling like you want to go up for seconds when you're done eating, I simply ask that you wait 15 minutes, right? Give your stomach time to tell your brain that you're actually feeling full. Now, you might find that after those 15 minutes, you actually don't want or need that second helping anymore. And that's great. But if you do, by all means, go up and have that second helping, right? There's just some days, especially if you just started a new exercise routine, that we need a little more food. And so it's really important to listen to our body. Okay. Now, sometimes there does become a point that our kidneys can no longer keep up with the demands from our body. So at this point, it might be necessary to start dialysis. Typically when we're in end-stage renal failure is when we need the dialysis. And this is usually when we've lost about 85 to 90% of our kidney function. So usually the GFR is less than 15. So what dialysis does is it helps to remove the excess waste, and salt and fluids, and helps to keep safe levels of things like potassium, sodium, bicarbonate in our blood. And it also helps to control our blood pressure. So basically dialysis is doing everything that our kidneys can't do for us. Now there are two main types of dialysis, peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis. So peritoneal dialysis is the one that's shown on the picture on the left-hand side of the screen here. So with peritoneal dialysis, fluid is placed into the abdomen where the lining of the abdomen, which is called the peritoneum is. So the peritoneum serves as a natural filtering membrane. So while the dialysis fluid diffuses the waste out of the blood, then the fluid can be removed out of the peritoneum and that helps to clean out the blood. So this is usually done several times each day or it can even be done overnight in your home. The second type of dialysis is called hemodialysis. And that is the one pictured on the left-hand side of the screen. So now in hemodialysis, a line goes from the body. So you can kind of see it pictured on the wrists of the person in this picture here. So a line goes from the body to a dialysis machine where the blood is cleaned, filtered, and then sent back to your body. So this is usually done like three times a week and usually takes about four, maybe six hours. Um, it's usually done in like a hospital or a dialysis clinic. So it's really best to talk to your doctor about where and what kind of dialysis would be best for you. And just know that while dialysis is not a cure for kidney disease, it can really help to provide a good quality of life in end-stage renal disease. Okay. So now let's talk about the emotional barriers that we can experience with a chronic kidney disease diagnosis. First, we're gonna start by talking about how to manage our mental health. So it's really important to have someone that you can talk to. Confiding in someone you trust, like a family member or a friend or a counselor, just anyone that you can talk to will help to lessen the weight you feel on your shoulders when dealing with a chronic disease. And to that point, don't be afraid to share with others because everyone has their own unique challenges. So while yours might be chronic kidney disease, someone else might have something that, deal, that they're dealing with and you find that you can really help to connect and help each other through tough situations and you know, by learning and sharing what's going on in your own lives. And don't be hard on yourself, right? So it's really easy to get down on ourselves, but don't. I mean, living with chronic kidney disease can be stressful, can be a lot to manage, but we need to celebrate the, the small successes, focus on you know, the positive things. Just because we're living with chronic kidney disease, it does not mean it's not manageable, right? It can be very overwhelming in the, in the beginning, but it's very manageable. I love this picture here. <laughs> Do not disturb. Um, so next, it's really important to find a routine, right? So especially for the days when you're not feeling well or maybe things might not have gone very well for you that day, find a routine that can help you to de-stress and to reconnect with the things that bring you joy. 
right? So that you can find joy in those small areas and then just take charge of your living. So living with chronic kidney disease doesn't mean you have to give up on all your goals, right? Start by making small, realistic goals and working towards them. Then take charge of your health one step at a time, whether it's diet or exercise. You can have a really big impact on your kidney health and your overall health with the decisions you make from day to day. And then finally, don't forget to spend some time pampering yourself, right? We all deserve that from time to time. And living with chronic kidney disease can be very stressful. And you do really need to take the time to unwind and care for yourself. Oftentimes, spending a little time pampering ourselves can make us better able to tackle the hard challenges when they come along. Okay, so now let's talk about ways that we can recognize if we're experiencing anxiety and depression. And this is important because advanced kidney disease and depress depression actually share many of the same symptoms like fatigue, sleep problems, poor appetite, trouble concentrating, right? So we have to find where that overlap is. And, and this is why it can be really important to talk to your healthcare provider as well, right? And get to the bottom of what's causing these symptoms. Because while we may think that we are just dealing with the symptoms of kidney disease, we could actually be experiencing anxiety and depression. So a few other symptoms of depression would include things like difficulty doing things you would normally enjoy, feeling guilty, shame. Maybe you find yourself crying more than normal or you're just really sad or you're irritated really easily. Um, maybe you find yourself withdrawing from friends or family or or even have feelings or thoughts of self-harm. So these are pretty serious emotions and we would need to tackle these so that we can maintain our mental health, right? Because again, by maintaining our mental health, we'll be better able to care for our physical health and in turn our kidney health. So it's all very, very related. So if you do find that you're feeling extra stress or anxiety, there are some things you can do to help improve your mood and your mental health. So one of the first things you can do is honestly by eating healthier foods. And I know I have a slightly biased opinion being a dietitian, but food is good for our physical health, our mental health, everything. So, you know, obviously it, this, you know, food is good for our physical health and our kidney health, but there are foods that are actually make us feel better, right? So we can actually improve our health, well-being by eating the right foods. So eating foods like fruits and vegetables, whole, healthy whole grains, things like that. It helps to give us more energy. These can strengthen our immune system, can help to keep our gut working better. And so overall, this helps to relieve our mental stress because we're feeling physically better, right? Um, Another thing is to try to limit the amount of salt and caffeine that you're having on a daily basis. So salt can also really impact our blood pressure, right? And that can make us feel pretty unwell. And that can add to our mental stress, again, if we're, if we're not feeling physically well. And caffeine can actually make stress and anxiety worse. So caffeine can't cause stress or anxiety, but it can increase those feelings. Um, so, and likewise, it's also important to limit things like sugar and fats that we're eating. Sugar cravings are common in times of stress, but caving into those cravings can just cause us to have more cravings on the road and can send our emotions on a bit of a roller coaster ride as we deal with the sugar highs and lows. In addition, fats, specifically saturated fats, have also been linked to increases in stress and anxiety because again, they feel us leaving physically unwell. And again, that can take its toll on our mental health too. Likewise, don't forget to set aside time to relax, whether it's using relaxation techniques like yoga and meditation, or just by taking time out of the day to sit down and pray, right? Anything you can do to relax and unwind can help to relieve that stress, which again, if we improve our mental health, we improve our physical health and our kidney health. Okay, in addition, don't forget about talking, right, with friend, healthcare professional, a loved one, anyone that we can talk to, it can really help to reduce that stress because it's important to talk about our feelings and our emotions um, that can help us to deal with the stress and pressure that comes with chronic kidney disease, knowing that we have that support system, people that understand and can connect with us. 
Um, now, when taking all these things into mind, it's important to think about where you're going to start with everything that we just talked about, right? Because that's it, it, we've talked about a lot. So prioritize them into goals that you would like to achieve. Now, we may see this list of goals and we're like, I'm ready. I, I, I really want to take all these on, but don't try to tackle all the goals at once because honestly, that could just add more stress. It's really important to prioritize those goals into what you want to work on. Pick one or two to start with. And then as you tackle each goal and take that on, you conquer it, then you can take on the next goal. And you'll find that goal after goal, you'll be improving your mental health, your physical health, and your kidney health. And with that, keep the goals realistic. Right? It may not be smart to throw out everything in the pantry and start a brand new diet. That could be pretty stressful, right? Likewise, it may not be smart to start going to the gym seven days a week if you haven't been going to the gym regularly. So rather than revamping our entire lifestyle and be, it becoming overwhelming and stressful, it may be better to just start with small goals like start by planning dinner each night or replacing one healthy snack each day or starting to work out two days of work, <laughs> two days a week, right? Start small and celebrate the small successes because that's how we get to our long-term bigger goals. Um, and another thing with that we may take for granted is getting enough sleep. So sleep is really important to our mental health and our physical health. Staying on a consistent sleep schedule, getting enough sleep at night, not only does our body get to rebuild and recharge at night, but it can actually prevent cravings of like sweets, desserts, carbohydrates, cravings, things like that the next day. Um, and again, that can help to improve our mental health in the long run. So something that can help you fall asleep at night and can improve our mental health is getting in, into a regular exercise routine. So exercise is actually scientifically proven to help improve our mood and our mental health. Exercise can help with everything from stress to anxiety to depression. After a bout of exercise, we can actually feel happier for hours afterwards, right? It's just a really effective way to improve our mental health. And again, of course, our physical health, right? So just keeping all this in mind, um, I know it says, you know, go on a vacation, right? And that's that's so true. Going on a vacation, we can definitely de-stress on a vacation, right? But if we have not taken the time to make sure that the environment we will come home to has reduced our stress, we're just going to come home to that same stress, right? If we go on vacation, but we don't tackle any of the goals at home, we're just going to be wreaking havoc on our physical and mental health when we come home. So take the time to make your goals a priority and then take that vacation to celebrate and to de-stress knowing that you'll come home to a nice, healthy environment. Okay, so next up, let's talk about sexual function because some people with kidney disease have questions about their sexual health. So you may notice a change in your interest in sex when you're having kidney disease. So there are many things that can affect your sexual health if you have kidney disease or kidney failure. So like hormones, nerves, energy levels, or even the medicines that you're taking. Likewise, emotions can also affect our sexual function. So things like stress, depression, or even nerves of, you know, disability or death can cause, you know, to can have an effect on our sexual function. So in addition, kidney disease can have physical changes that can make us feel less attractive. And these are all things that you can talk to your healthcare team about. Don't be afraid to ask questions and get help when needed. So now let's talk about kidney disease and reproduction. So while sperm production is not typically affected by kidney disease, complications in utero can occur. So pregnancy can actually put a lot of stress on the body. I think we kind of know that, but having kidney disease or kidney failure can put you and the health of your unborn child at risk. Pregnancy can also make your kidney disease worse. So if you're thinking about becoming pregnant, you should definitely discuss this carefully with your doctor. Finally, don't forget to reach out to the many different types of support groups that are out there. This can be really helpful in managing your mental and physical health. There are just a ton of different groups out there that can offer support. 
anything from free online chat clubs to websites and virtual support groups. There's, you know, something for everyone. And, you know, you may try one or two and find that they're not for you and that's okay. I would say just don't give up. Take, take the time to find the group that fits your needs and works in your life. Okay, so as you can see, there are a lot of different support groups um, for just about anything you could be looking for. There are a lot of different options here, so feel free to either take a picture of these lists on your phone, maybe take a screenshot on your computer, um, and then don't forget that all of these webinars are recorded, so you can come back at any time and take a look at all of these different support groups that we've mentioned here um, and you know, just kind of see which one would be the right one for you. Okay, so now let's go into the discussion and question portion of the webinar. So you can use the question tab on your toolbar if you have any questions. Just kind of give people a minute here to see. If get any good questions. While you guys are thinking and typing, I will say that one of the questions I get asked quite frequently is about, you know, what is the best exercise program? You know, what's the best workout routine? And to be honest, the best exercise program is the one you enjoy. I'm dead serious. It is whatever you most enjoy that because that is what we're going to stick with. If it doesn't bring us joy, we're not going to be as inclined to keep up with it. It's not going to be as motivating, right? So if we enjoy it, we look forward to it. It's a it's a it's a part of our day that we can't wait for. Then we're going to be more inclined to stick with it. And because consistency is the key with any, you know, whether it's diet, exercise, consistency is always the key. So if you can find something that you truly enjoy, that's what you're going to stick with that's gonna bring you the best overall health, right? And that's why sometimes too, if you can find a workout buddy, um, that's really great with accountability. I, look, no one's perfect. There are days when we're not gonna feel motivated to get out of bed and, or get, you know, get out of a long day of work and go exercise, it, it happens. So having either a workout routine that you just love and you can't wait to hit each day or a friend, a workout buddy to do it with so that you have that accountability and that motivation to go to the gym or go for that walk, um, that can be really huge. Thought I saw someone type in a question, so I'll give it one more minute here. While you guys are, you know, thinking or typing, um, another question I commonly get asked is like, if there's a, a specific diet or diet plan to follow. Um, and this is where our Cecilia Health Dietitians and clinicians can be a really big help because honestly, every body is different, right? So every body is going to have different needs, you know, depending on your kidney health, if you have diabetes, pre-diabetes, what your family history is, what your blood pressure, cholesterol, like all those things are what we at Cecilia Health take into account when we're talking with everyone and, and coming up with, you know, what are, what are the best snacks? What are the best breakfast and lunch and dinner? Um, so there's no one best diet. There really isn't. It's, it's going to be different for everyone. But the one thing I tell everyone is that, honestly, I think the biggest key to sticking with anything, and we kind of talked about this a little bit in the webinar, is meal planning, right? Like writing down what we're going to have. Maybe you just pick lunch and dinner every day because you already know what you're going to do for breakfast. Maybe it's you write down what your snacks are going to be every day. You grocery shop for those items. And then for that week or two or however long you plan it for, you don't have to think about what you're going to eat. You already know that you have healthy meals, healthy snacks planned, you know, all the foods in your kitchen ready to go waiting for you. It takes all the guesswork, all the stress out of eating. So there may not be one best diet plan, but meal planning, I think, is definitely the key to sticking to our health goals. Okay, so if there is not any other questions, and if any pop up, I can certainly come back to them. Um, just wanted to let you guys know that we do have a couple of 
live webinars coming up. So don't forget, you can always go to ceciliahealth.com slash webinars, and you can always get a list there of our upcoming live webinars. And there's also our past and re recorded webinars on there. Uh, but our next webinars will be on November 2nd. We will have chronic kidney disease and diabetes. <clears throat> And then on November 13th, we will have Embracing the Holidays Without Deprivation, Healthy Eating Strategies for Every Festive Eater. So really, really good timing with that one with you know the holiday season coming up. And so that could be really useful in helping to stick to our, to our health goals. And don't forget, if you ever want to attend more live events, you can go to that CeciliaHealth.com webinar or backslash webinar, or you can ask your clinician. Um, you can simply reply to one of your emails. They can share all the online events with you. If you haven't signed up for your text messages, ask your clinician because that they can also be shared that way. And then don't forget to check us out on Facebook. So our Cecilia Health Coaching Facebook page with link is down there at the bottom. And again, you guys can come back and watch these webinars at any time and click on any of those links. All right. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was wonderful. Thank you for um, such a, so much good information. I hope that was um, helpful for those of you listening. And uh, remember, if there's anything that you want to talk about further um, or you uh, changes that you think you might want to make, be sure to talk to your doctor. And of course, you know, the next time you have a call uh, scheduled with one of your coaches, you, they can definitely help to kind of elaborate and maybe talk about the topic uh, more personally to you and what you have going on. So, okay, well, everybody, well, um, I did want to make a note. The next webinar is the uh, CKD and diabetes is next week. So it's pretty quick if you wanted to watch it. Um, but we wanted to get it in before all the holiday craziness started. So hope to see you there and have a nice evening.